you believe Give charity For the pleasure of Allah The pleasure of Allah Oh, you who believe Read the Quran Every night of Ramadan Night of Ramadan Welcome, oh Ramadan It is Ramadan It is Ramadan Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic Ramadan. The Month of Self-Improvement and Islam, Part 2. Dr. Zakir, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, Dr. Zakir, in the last episode, we were mentioning, or you mentioned, and I listened, uh, to the uh, 70 major sins, and we shall continue to discuss one by one, inshallah, a random selection of those, and the first of those today will be the major sin of zina. So, first of all, can you tell me what is the Islamic perspective on zina and what is the prescribed punishment in Islam for doing that sin? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajmeen. Amma abad. Awuzu billahi minash shaytani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yassili amri. Zina means illegal sexual intercourse or when a man and woman who are not married, if they have a sexual intercourse, it's called a zina. It means sexual intercourse outside the marriage bond. And the Islamic Sharia, its basic aim is to preserve the honor and lineage. That is the reason zina that is illegal sexual intercourse, it is a major sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, come not close to zina, come not close to unlawful sexual intercourse, for it is a shameful deed, an evil opening other roads to evil. Islam has tried its best to protect the honor of the man and the woman. And there are various guidelines given in the Sharia and the Quran Hadith which prevents a person from coming close to Zina. Number one is hijab has been prescribed. And besides hijab for the woman, hijab for the man also. For the woman, her complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say that even this should be covered. And Allah says, about the hijab, Allah has prescribed the hijab for the man first in the Quran and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Moment a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. It says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not a beauty except what appears ordinary of, and draw her veil over the bosom, and the verse continues. So basically, lowering the gaze is very important, which prevents zina to a great extent. And the punishment for this unlawful sexual intercourse, zina, there are two types of punishments, depending upon the type of zina. Zina can be of two types. Number one is that unlawful sexual intercourse done by an unmarried man and woman. It's called as fornication in English. And if unlawful sexual intercourse is done by a married man or woman, it is called as adultery. The punishment for both, it differs. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 2, As for the woman 
and man who commit fornication, as for the fornicator, be it a woman or a man, flog each with hundred stripes, means give them hundred lashes, and let not your heart be moved towards them. And let a group of believers witness the punishment. That means if any man or woman who is not married, if they have unlawful sexual intercourse, the punishment is 100 lashes, flogging them with 100 lashes. And as far as punishment for adultery is concerned, unlawful sexual intercourse done by a married man or woman, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Hudud, hadith number 6814, a man approaches Prophet Muhammad and says that I have committed adultery. And the man, he bears witness four times that he has committed adultery and the Prophet, he ordered that he should be punished, he should be stoned to death because he was a married man. So the punishment for adultery, unlawful sexual intercourse done by a married man in Islam, it is stoned to death. It's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Hudud, hadith number 6815 and 6816, that there was a man who approached the Prophet Muhammad and told him that he had committed unlawful sexual intercourse, he had committed zina. So the Prophet turned away from him. Again the man approached the Prophet and bore witness four times that he had committed unlawful sexual intercourse, he had committed zina. So the Prophet asked him that, are you mad? He said, no. The Prophet asked him, are you married? He said, yes. So the Prophet ordered that he should be stoned to death. This again proves that for adultery, zina, unlawful sexual intercourse done by a mad man or woman, the punishment is stoned to death. It's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Hudud, hadith number 6819, there was a Jew and a Jewess who were caught committing adultery and they were brought to the Prophet. The Prophet asked them that in your religion, what is the punishment for adultery? So they said that our priest had innovated that the faces should be blackened with charcoal. The Prophet said, get your scripture and show it to me. The man gets the scripture and he covers something and then he reads it. So one of the Sahabas says, please remove your hand. And the moment the hand was removed, it was mentioned down there that Rajam, stoning to death, should be given to a person who commits adultery. So even in the Jewish scripture, even in the Christian scripture, the punishment for adultery is thrown into death. And the Prophet commanded that both of them, the Jew and the Jewess, both should be thrown to death. It's mentioned in Sahib Muslim, volume number three, in the book of Hudud, hadith number 4191, that the Prophet said that anyone who commits zina, if an unmarried man or woman commits zina, that is to fornication, the punishment is giving 100 lashes and they should be banished for one year. And the Prophet continues and says that anyone who does zina, who is married, anyone who does unlawful sexual intercourse, does adultery, if a person is married, man or woman, then the punishment is giving them 100 stripes, lashing them 100 times and then thrown into death. So this is the different type of punishment for zina and it is one of the major sin in Islam and in Al-Qabair, Imam al-Dhabi, he gives number 10 to the sin, zina, adultery and fornication. Well, uh, Dr. Zakia, I feel that um, those two punishments are enough to frighten the most stalwart of uh, individuals from zina. May Allah protect us from that. That's an Islamic country where that punishment is not in the non-Muslim country. Ah. So if it's put for the world, inshallah, zina would be removed. Inshallah. From the faith of the inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah allow us to bring back that punishment to protect all humanity, inshallah. Amen. So could you explain to me what the punishment in Islam is regarding homosexuality? And could you clear up a small issue relating to the, the so-called gay gene, which is scientists are speaking about now? Many homosexuals consider this it's almost a divine right for them to practice homosexuality. Is this correct? Is it genetic? What's your advice? As far as the Islamic punishment for homosexuality is concerned, Allah speaks in the Quran 
and the messenger speaks in the hadith in several verses talking about homosexuality allah says in the quran in surah araf chapter number 7 verse number 80 as well as 81 allah says he speaks about the story of ruth alayhi salam and ruth alayhi salam says to his people that do you practice lewdness which no one before in the creation had ever done that mean do you practice lewdness such a thing which no one in creation had ever done before and do you lust after men in preference to women that means talking to the men that do you run after men have lust for men in preference to women a similar message is repeated in surah ankabut chapter number 29 verse number 20 and 29 where ruth alayhi salam he says to his people that do you practice lewdness such that no other people in the creation had ever done before and do you approach men and cut off highways again talking about homosexuality and the punishment that allah gives for such people is mentioned in surah hud chapter number 11 verse number 82 and allah says that he turns the cities upside down the city of lut alayhi salam sodom and gomorrah he turns these cities upside down and he brings a hail of brimstone of hard baked clay layer after layer and as far as punishment for an individual person who commits homosexuality it's mentioned in abu daud volume number 3 in the book of hudud hadith number 4447 where the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that anyone who does the sin of people of lut alayhi salam he should be put to death the person who does it and the person on whom it is done so homosexuality is forbidden in islam and the punishment for homosexuality is death as far as the second part of the question is concerned that is homosexuality genetic there was a research done some 15 20 years back in the early 90s where there were a group of scientists who suggested that homosexuality is genetic afterwards when more research was done it was proven that the research is totally wrong and the person who first propounded this research he himself was homosexual and there are several articles written against homosexuality being genetic if you read the article of 6th of april year 2004 in lifestyle news.com the article written that born or bred talking about homosexuality by robert knight and this was mainly done by a concern of group of american women who tried to prove that homosexuality is not genetic because they were concerned robert knight he has picked up various articles from different scientists and different people in the field and proved that homosexuality was not genetic he even quotes dr robert spitzer in lifesitenews.com who is the professor of psychiatry in the columbia university in usa he proves that homosexuality is not genetic and in 1973 he removed from the american psychiatric association list which was mentioned that homosexuality is a mental illness he proved it wrong and removed it from the list it's not a mental illness and he did a research and he gave advice to more than 200 people who homosexuals and after advice many of them left homosexuality the person who first said that homosexuality was genetic was dean hammer who was from america national institute of health and he did a research on 40 pairs of homosexuals and he said that there was a gay gene which was responsible for homosexuality being genetic later on dr george rice he tried to repeat this experiment of dean hammer and he took 52 pairs of homosexuals but unfortunately he could not find any gay gene and when it was proved that homosexuality was genetic was a fallacy then hammer said that you know the sample was bigger therefore they could not find my sample was small and he gave excuses 
and later on many scientists and many psychiatrists and many researchers did research and they found it without doubt that homosexuality was not genetic and even Dr. Alan Sanders of National Institute of Health, the same institute where Dean Hammer came from, he did uh, research and presented the paper on the 1st of June 1998 in Toronto in the psychiatric conference and it proved without doubt that homosexuality was not genetic. So, but natural, it can't be genetic and sin cannot be inherited. That's not the concept of Islam. It's a concept of Christianity and other religions. But in Islam, no bearer of burden can bear the burden of others. So, but natural, no sin can be inherited and neither homosexuality can be inherited. Well, Jazakallah khair for clearing that um, issue up because I'm sure there are many Muslims who still uh, ponder that issue of the, the gay gene which was spoken about more than 10 years ago now, is it? Or slightly less than 10 years ago? 14 years. And, but it still seems to be a view which is accepted. So, may Allah preserve us. But those who don't have knowledge, those who have knowledge, they know for sure that it's a fallacy. Dr. Zaki, the next issue we need to bring up is riba, again, one of the major sins. And unfortunately, nowadays, many Muslims consider riba to be completely lawful in this modern world that we live in. What's your advice according to Quran and Sunnah? I do agree that there are many Muslims who consider riba not to be interest and they think it's lawful, but riba means anything over and above. It includes usury, that's exorbitant interest, but it even includes interest because by definition interest is money earned on money lent and usury is exorbitant interest. So whether small or big, riba is haram, it includes interest as well as usury. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the word riba in the Quran no less than eight times. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161, in Surah Bakra, chapter number 2, verse number 275, it has been used thrice. It's even mentioned in Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse number 276, as well as Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse 278 and 279, where Allah says in these two verses, that give up your demands of riba, of interest, of usury. And those who do not give up the demands of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you indulge in riba, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. There are other major sins like having intoxicants, having alcohol, drugs, etc. But this, besides being a major sin, the ruling is that Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. It is the only verse in the Quran for the only major sin where Allah and Rasul wage a war against you, it is riba. So it is one of the biggest major sins. That is the reason it has been rated in the category number 12 in Al Qabair by Imam al Dahabi, mentioned number 12. And as far as the punishment is concerned, it's mentioned Sai Muslim, volume number 3, hadith number 3881, the beloved Prophet, he cursed those people who accept riba and who give riba. Those who take interest and give interest. Those who record it, as well as the two witnesses, all of them are the same. The Prophet says that all these people are cursed. The person who gives riba, the person who takes riba, the person who records riba, the person who is a witness. All of them are cursed and all of the same level. It's further mentioned in Mustadak al-Hakim, hadith number 2259, the beloved Prophet said that there are 73 different types of riba, different degrees of riba. And the lowest one is equivalent to a man doing zina with his mother. The lowest level of riba, or the 73 level, is equivalent to a man doing zina with his mother. And this is a Sahih Hadith. And it's mentioned in Muslim Ahmad, Volume number 5, page number 225, also in same hadith repeated in Sayyid Al-Jamiyah, hadith number 3375, the beloved Prophet said that anyone 
who takes riba equivalent to one dirham, it's worse than a man committing zina 36 times. If you take one dirham of riba, it's worse than a man committing zina 36 times. So this is the punishment and the enormity of sin in Islam. And we see today that most of the Western countries, they are drowned in riba. Everything is an interest. You take a loan, you're an interest. You can take a house on interest. You can take a car on interest, the credit card. So everyone, and in this scenario, it makes a poor man more poor. It can make many rich men go bankrupt. Otherwise, the other people, are rich men, become more rich. And there are various evils, and I've given a talk on this topic, interest-free economy promulgated by the glorious Quran. That have proved all the evils of Rabbah. And we see that today, a man will make more profit if he has the concept of Islamic business, profit and loss sharing, rather than based on interest. That's the reason most of the top companies, they're zero debt companies. They don't take loan from the bank. They prefer opening issues and having shares and sharing the profit with the public. That's the Islamic concept. And all the top companies, they are debt-free companies. You'll find that they don't take any loan. So they are working actually on the Islamic concept. Well, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to work on the Islamic concept. Get rid of riba, the interest, the usury, as you've called it. Um, following on from the uh, first question regarding riba, is it permissible for a Muslim to put his savings in an interest or riba bearing account or bank for safety purposes if he or she pays the interest that he earns out in charity? Most of the scholars, they say that if under compulsion, especially if you're a non-Muslim country and for safety reason, you can keep your money in the interest based conventional bank, but whatever interest you get, you have to give in charity without seeking the reward of Allah because it's haram. Most of the scholars say that, but I personally, I disagree with them. That's my view. I agree more with the view of Sheikh Utaymi. He says that even this is prohibited because the Quran does not say do not use interest. If the Quran would have said do not utilize, do not use interest, then the verdict was right. The Quran said don't involve in riba. Don't take, don't give. So if you have to give in charity, first you have to take from the bank. So I disagree with that. If you have to stop the system of riba, you have to totally ban the system. We can't say they'll put for safety and then I'll take the money and give on charity. Indirectly, you're encouraging them. Because the moment you open an account which has got interest, you are signing and giving them permission that you're agreeing with interest with riba. That itself is a sin. So Allah's curse will be on you. Allah the will wage a war against you. Because I ask this question and I say to these people who say that you can put in the bank and give in charity, that suppose I deal in drugs, in cocaine, in brown sugar, and suppose I invest a million dollars. Every month I make a profit of a million dollars and the complete profit I give in charity to the poor people. When I ask, is it allowed? He said, no, it's haram. I said, why? Because dealing in drugs, cocaine, brown sugar is haram. So when dealing in drugs, cocaine, brown sugar is haram, riba is a bigger haram. Because if you deal in riba, Allah and Rasul will wage a war against you. So when you're giving me permission to keep in the bank and deal with riba for a bigger sin, surely you should give me permission for a smaller sin. So therefore, I disagree that if they really want to keep for safety, they can very well keep in an Islamic bank. Or as a last resort, they can keep in a current account. There are some accounts in the bank which are accounts which don't give interest. They call it current account. There's no interest at all in that. That as a last resort you can keep, but only keep that money which is required for only because I know that being in different countries like in India, in UK, you have to deal with checks, etc. So if you're a businessman, keep only that much amount which is required for rolling. Otherwise, you can invest it in property, in real estate, in stocks, whatever it is. And the least if you want for security, you can take a locker and keep hard cash in the bank. 
I know it's foolish, but yet it is better than involving in Rabbah. At least you'll be safe from Allah and His Rasul. Otherwise, they'll wage a war against you. As a last resort, if you really want only security, take a locker, which will cost just a few hundred rupees a month or a couple of thousand rupees a year and a few pounds if you go to UK. Take that locker, keep your money hard cash. Declare it to the government, no problem, but keep hard cash. If you really want security. But taking riba and even giving in charity because they're encouraging the system of riba, I consider that to be haram. Okay, I mean, in the UK, alhamdulillah, we do have a few banks now coming up, by the way. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to encourage those organizations to do non interest. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may these organizations be on the straight path. I mean, I mean, see to it that they're truly interest free. Inshallah, inshallah. The next uh, issue I'd like to ask you about, Dr. Zakir, is um, concerning alcohol. What does Islam say about alcohol? Does it prohibit it entirely? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhu lazina amunu, O you believe, inna mal khamru al maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansawabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to min amali shaitan, these are said to the handiwork. First, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. So Allah says, this is rich summin amali shaitan. It's a certain handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. And Imam Adhabi in his list of Al-Qabair, the 70 major sins, he puts having alcohol, intoxicants, khamar, having wine, number 19 in the list. And having intoxicants is even prohibited in Christianity. If you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1. It says that wine is a mocker. It is strong raging drink. And anyone who is deceived, he is not wise. It's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18. Be not drunk with wine. But unfortunately, we find that none of the Christians and the Jews, they follow the advice given in the Bible, unfortunately. And what is the logic, the reason that Islam has prohibited alcohol? Normally in a human being, there is an inhibitory center. This inhibitory center, it prevents a human being from doing things which are illogical and not correct. For example, if a person wants to go to the call of nature, the inhibitory center will say that don't do it in a public place, go to the toilet. Inhibitory center is working. An inhibitory center, when a person speaks to the parents, tells that don't be disrespectful to parents, don't use foul language. So this is the work of inhibitory center. When a person is intoxicated, when a person has intoxication, has wine, has alcohol, the inhibitory center is inhibited. And he doesn't know what he's speaking, therefore you find many of them, they start cursing, they start doing verbal abuse, you find them saying obscene things, you may find them that they urinate in their own clothes, so this is because the inhibitory center is inhibited. And if we analyze that alcohol is responsible for many crimes that take place. According to the US Department of Justice, 1996, every day in the year 1996, 2,713 cases of rape took place. That means every third to second, one rape is taking place in America in 1996. And the report says that majority of the people who committed rape, they were intoxicated. Furthermore, according to American statistics, it says that 8% of the Americans, they indulge in incest, having intercourse with the close relative. And it says that every 12th person you come across in America, they're doing incest, and majority of them, they're in a state of intoxication when they do incest. So we realize that alcoholism, besides being bad for the health, it's a cause for many diseases and health-wise, and even it's a cause for AIDS, which has recently cropped up. And there are many people who say that I am a social drinker, and I have only one peg, I don't get intoxicated. When you interview the alcoholics, all of them, when we ask them, they will say that initially they were social drinkers. No alcoholic starts to drink because he wants to become an alcoholic. All of them are social drinkers. And later on, they become alcoholics. 
And if you meet any social drinker who has been drinking for a couple of years, you ask him that how many times he's been intoxicated. And there will be several times that he's been intoxicated with all the power that he has. And once a person is intoxicated, and if he commits a sin like rape, like incest, it's an unforgivable sin and irreversible damage done. And we realize that that's the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 3, Book of Intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3371. The beloved Prophet said that intoxication, alcohol, is the mother of all evils. Alcohol is the mother of all evils. And it's further mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 3, Book of Intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3392. The beloved Prophet said, that anything which intoxicates in large quantity is even prohibited in small quantity. No excuse for Nippur at all. You can't say that I'll take a peg, you know. Whatever intoxicates in large quantity is even prohibited in small quantity. And the beloved prophet, he has cursed 10 categories of people who indulge in alcohol. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number 3, Book of Intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3380. The beloved prophet said, 10 categories of people who indulge in alcohol are cursed. The one who distills it, the one for whom it is distilled, the one who drinks it, the one who transports it, the one for whom it is bought, the one who sells it, the one who serves it, the one who utilizes the earnings from the sale of alcohol, the one who buys it, the one who buys it for somebody else. So all these ten categories of people, they are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are various different diseases that a person can acquire when he has alcohol. And today, alcohol is one of the major causes for the maximum number of deaths in the world. And today science tells us, and many people are aware of it, that the various diseases a person can have. The most common is cirrhosis of liver. If a person is alcoholic, has high chances of having cirrhosis of liver. He can have cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the head and neck, cancer of the bowel, cancer of the liver. He can have gastritis, he can have esophagitis, pancreatitis, hepatitis. A person who has alcohol, there are chances that he will have cardiomyopathy. He will have angina heart attack, atherosclerosis, he can have strokes, apoplexy, fits. A person who has alcohol regularly, there are high chances that the person, he can have cortical neuropathy, cerebral neuropathy, he can have peripheral neuroma. There are various diseases that a person can have due to the consumption of alcohol. Diseases such as Wernick's Korsakoff syndrome that involves amnesia of the recent memory and retention of the old memory is due to thiamine deficiency. A person who has alcohol, he can have delirium tremens, which is associated with alcohol. A person can have pellagra and he can have skin diseases. A person who takes alcohol regularly, there are high chances that he can have endocrinal disorders like mixed edema, like hypothyroidism. He can have hematological disorders like macrocytic anemia. He can have jaundice. He can have thrombocytopenia. He can have platelet disorders. A person who has alcohol, there are chances that the common drugs like metronidazole, flagyl, they can create a problem for a person who has alcohol regularly. A person with alcohol regularly, he can have infections because the immunity system is decreased. There are high chances that he can have chest infections like lung abscess, emphysema, pulmonary tuberculosis. A person who is a woman, she can get affected more by alcohol and the cirrhosis of liver is much dangerous in the woman. If she's pregnant, she can have the alcohol fetal syndrome. They can be skin disorders like alopecia. 
they can be nail dystrophy, they can be angulostomatitis. You can keep on listing the diseases for us together only because of the consumption of alcohol. But nowadays my colleagues, the medical doctors, they say that alcoholism is a disease. You know, they try to pacify that don't be rude to the alcoholic, no, don't blame him. Alcoholism is a disease. If alcoholism is a disease, it is the only disease that is sold in bottles. It is the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on the radio broadcast stations. It's advertised in the satellite channels, in the television. It is the only disease that has licensed outlets for its sale. It is the only disease that brings a revenue to the government. It is the only disease that causes violent deaths on the highways. It is the only disease that ruins family. It is the only disease that has got no viral or germ cause. It's not a disease. As Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, Rish sum min amali shaitan. It is a Satan's handiwork. First anibula lukum to flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. SubhanAllah, I think we've got enough reasons to stay very clear of alcohol. All of us, all of humanity indeed. InshaAllah. Jazakallah khair for the answer. Here, Dr. Zakia, I would like to know now, next issue, which is to do with slandering and backbiting. Can you tell us the ruling, Islamic ruling, regarding slandering and backbiting? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 12, that do not spy. Avoid spying. For in most cases, spying is a sin. Do not backbite. Do not speak ill about other people behind the back. Are you ready to eat the flesh of your dead brother? No, you would abhor it. That means if you backbite, Allah says in the Quran, it is like eating the flesh of your dead brother. And would you like it? And the answer is no. Eating your brother itself is haram. Eating dead meat is a double sin. Even the cannibals who eat human beings, they don't eat the dead meat of their own brother. The Quran says that backbiting is equivalent to eating the dead meat of your own brother. It's further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 6265, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that, do you know what is backbiting? So the Sahaba says, Allah and his messenger know the best. The Prophet continues that anyone who speaks about another person behind his back, which he would not like when it is spoken, that is called as backbiting. So one person interrupts and says, what if what I'm speaking is true? The person does have those faults. So the Prophet says that if you speak about someone behind somebody's back and if it is the truth, it is backbiting. If it's false, it's called as slandering. So both are prohibited, backbiting as well as slandering. Both are prohibited. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Humza, chapter number 104, verse number 1, وَيْلُلِّ كُلِّ هُمَزَةِ الْلُمَزَى Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. And it's mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, poem number 1, in the book of Wudu, hadith number 216. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was passing near a graveyard, and he heard that two of the Muslims, they were crying and mourning because of the punishment that they were having in their graves. The Prophet says that, do you know for what reasons are they crying? The Sahaba says, no. So he says, one, because he never used to be careful about his urine, you know, that you have to be careful, protect oneself from one's urine. And the other one, because he used to make enemy between the people. So, based on the verses of the Quran and the Hadith, backbiting and slandering, both are prohibited. Okay, I think that's very clear. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. So, regarding the lower garment of the male, I think particularly the male, uh, is it haram for a man to wear that um, below the ankle, even if that person isn't wearing it out of um, pride or arrogance? The Arabic word used 
when a lower garment is below the ankle, it is isbal. Whether it's your lower garment or your trouser or your izar or thobe, if it goes below the ankle, it's called as isbal. It may touch the floor or it may sleep on the floor. All these are a sin. And unfortunately, unfortunately, many Muslims, or rather most of them, they don't pay any importance to this major sin. And they think it's all right. Most of the Muslims, they wear the trouser below the ankle. Many of them, the trouser touches the floor. It even sweeps the floor. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of dress, hadith number 5787. The beloved Prophet said, the izar that goes below the ankle, that part will burn in fire. In the lower garment, whether it be izar, the trouser, if it goes below the ankle, that part will burn in the hellfire. It's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, book of dress, hadith number 5788. The beloved Prophet said that Allah will not look at the person on the day of resurrection, a person who wears a lower garment below the ankle and walks in pride. So wearing the lower garment below the ankle is prohibited. It's like a sign of pride and arrogance. And irrespective whether a person feels proud or not, it's haram. And it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number three, in the book of dress, hadith number 4083. It says that if your lower garment or your shirt or your turban, if they go below the ankle or till on the ground, then Allah will not look at you on the day of resurrection. So, Isbal, lower garment below the ankle, is a great sin. And people who say that if we wear it without arrogance and pride, it is permitted, this is the wrong thinking. It is the fallacy. Imagine at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told many Sahaba that wear your lower garment above the ankle and all of them wore. Imagine if we say that we can keep the lower garment or trouser below the ankle if you don't have pride. We are trying to indicate that we are better than the Sahaba. When the Prophet could tell the Sahaba that put your trouser above the ankle, wear the izar above the ankle, and we say that we need not do it, and if we think that if we do it without pride, it's not wrong, so we are trying to insinuate that we are better than the Sahaba, which is totally wrong. So that is the reason Isbal lowering the lower garment below the ankle with pride or without pride is haram. With pride is a bigger sin because you're doing a double sin. Lowering the garment plus you're proud and arrogant. So it's a double sin. Okay, thanks for the answer, Dr. Zakir. Dr. Zakir, next question. How does Islam reprimand a person who bears false witness in a court of law? As far as bearing false witness is concerned, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4, as for those who lay a false allegation against the chastity of a woman, and if he cannot produce four witnesses, then he should be lashed with 80 lashes. That means he should be flogged with 80 lashes, and his witness should not be ever considered in future. So this is a punishment for a person who gives a false witness. And further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, Book of Witnesses, Hadith number 2654, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu asked, that will I inform you of the greatest of the great sins? The people said, yes, O Messenger of Allah. So Muhammad Sallallahu replies that, number one, joining gods with Allah. Number two, being disrespectful to parents. And later on reclining, he said, number three is bearing false witness is a great sin. It's mentioned in Abu Dawud, volume number three, hadith number 3592. Beloved Prophet Muhammad said that after offering salah, he turns around and he says that bearing false witness is equivalent to attributing a partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this hadith, Muhammad says that bearing false witness is nearly as good as shirk. So that is the reason it is one of the major sins in Islam. Zakhalak, Dr. Zakir, for the answer. Dr. Zakir, how does Islam honor the chastity of a woman? There are many verses in the Quran and several hadith which speak about the chastity of the woman. 
our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, volume number one, hadith number 1661, the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the woman who prays five times, who fasts in the month of Ramadan, who preserves the chastity and takes care of the husband, that's obedient to the husband, she can enter paradise by any gate. She can go by any gate into paradise. That means a woman who's chaste, two of us, five times salah, fast in the month of Ramadan, and takes care of her husband, who's obedient to the husband, will enter paradise. It's further mentioned in the glorious Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 23 and 24, that anyone who lays an allegation against the chastity of a woman, he will have a grievous penalty in this world and the hereafter. And he will be put into hell. And on the day of judgment, his tongues, his limbs, and parts of his body will bear witness against him. It's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 4, that anyone who lays a false allegation against the chastity of women and cannot produce four witnesses, he will be given a punishment of flogging by 80 lashes. In future, his testimony, his witness will never be accepted. And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, hadith number 2766, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that, do you know the seven grievous sins? The people said, Allah's messenger knows the best. And he replies, number one, joining gods with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, practicing sorcery and black magic. Number three, murder. Number four, eating riba, interest. Number five, eating orphans' property unlawfully. Number six, showing your back to the enemy in the battlefield. And number seven, laying an allegation or slandering the chastity of women who is a true believer. So it's a grave sin to lay an allegation against the chastity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran protects the chastity of women. Alhamdulillah. Well, the last question today will be regarding um, horoscopes. Um, can you give the Islamic ruling on a person who um, consults um, astrology charts or horoscopes on a daily basis or weekly basis or at all? As far as astrology and fortune telling is concerned, nowadays it's very common in the world that we have in the newspapers, people speak about stars, about Capricorn and Libra and various signs and we find that many people believe in it. If anyone believes in the stars and the signs, fortune telling astrology, it's as good as shirk. He's called as mushrik. And a person who reads for entertainment, you know, many a time it comes in the paper and we will just glance for entertainment, then he is a sinner yet. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 1038, Muhammad after offering Fajr Salah, he turns around and he says, that Allah says that some of the people, they are believers in me and some are disbelievers in me. Those who believe that it rained, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they believe in me and they disbelieve in the star. And those who believe that it rained because of the star, they believe in the star and they disbelieve in me. It's further mentioned in Muslim Ahmad, volume number two, hadith number 9536, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if a person goes to a fortune teller and a soothsayer and believes in him, he has disbelieved in Muhammad that believed in me. And it's further mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 5540, beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who goes to a diviner, that's Araf, and believes in him, his prayer will not be accepted for 40 nights. So therefore, fortune telling and astrology are condemned in the Quran. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu. Oh, you believe, in namal khamru al maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu al azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rushtu minamali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, aniburu la lukum tuflihun. Abstain from it that you may prosper. So, fortune telling is a Satan's handiwork. You have to abstain from it so that we can prosper. Dr. Zakir, once again, excellent answers. Jazakallah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you greatly for all information or the knowledge you have of Qur'an and Sunnah which you've given us tonight in such an eloquent way. Jazakallah or khairan. Allah accept it from you. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, 
I hope you agree that the information that we've got, that we've gained from the last two episodes on uh, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islah, have been invaluable, particularly as we've only got eight days or so left of Ramadan. My advice is to you is to get on implementing as many of those gems and valuable pieces of information into your life quickly as possible, inshallah. If you want to learn more about uh, self-improvement during this month and Islah, you can watch part three tomorrow. So join us at the same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. حافظين ذاكرين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صب وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورفق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي